this is a long anticipated podcast that we said we were yeah. going to do. I think it was before Christmas now, wasn't it? And then one thing and another occurred and we've only just got around to doing it. Um, but I'm very excited for it because it's such a big topic for emetophobes. Yeah. We suffer with emetophobia and that's pregnancy. And the idea yeah. of falling pregnant as an emetophobe and morning sickness and everything that comes with pregnancy. So I just want to mention before we dive into this, um, that along with pregnancy comes particularly sensitive topics such as miscarriages and abortion. So just so listeners out there are aware that these topics may be covered as we start diving into the notion of pregnancy and emetophobia. So Brie, you put out um, a question on your social media um, for anybody out there who wanted a specific question answered. And the Mm -hmm. same one came back as you've had previously and I've had previously. The main question that we get asked, which is... Do you want to do you want to go for it? Yeah, why would anybody that has a metaphobia fall pregnant? Fabulous. And okay. it makes a lot of sense. It does. So, put everybody in in context. Myself and Brie are both exometophobes. We both suffered for a very long time with emetophobia. You can listen to both of our stories um in previous podcast episodes. But we are also both parents and we both got little girls, which is lovely. Um my little girl's one years old. I think Brie, yours is three, isn't she? Three, yeah. Three, yeah. So both relatively recent pregnancies. Now, the difference being Brie went through her pregnancy with emetophobia. I overcame my emetophobia before I fell pregnant. So two very, very different experiences of pregnancy. So it should make for a really interesting conversation. Now, the question of why would anybody fall pregnant when they've got emetophobia, I can't answer. Purely because... I didn't, I mean, I can answer, I can give it a good stab, right? But that was one of the main reasons I went through the program myself was because I wanted to fall pregnant and I couldn't envisage me doing that with a metaphobia. But Brie, you're slightly different. So do you want to dive into how and why you decided to get pregnant when you were still yeah, suffering with sure. a metaphobia? Yeah, I just want to say that that's amazing that that's why you did the program did. to be able yes. to do that. That is so good. And I wish that I had done that from the beginning because it would have made my life a lot easier. But from yeah. like a young age, I really wanted to be a mum and I always knew that that was a possibility. Like even though I had a metaphobia, I was like, it's going to happen. Um, yeah. And before doing the Thrive program, my primary desire for control was so strong. And for anyone that doesn't know what that means, it means that I could strongly influence most of the events and outcomes in my life. So this was me having my routines and my safety-seeking behaviours, people around me that I could rely on, um, things that I could avoid. And I also had a very low secondary control where if something was out of that primary control, I couldn't cope. But for the most part, I was focusing on me always being able to be in control of things. And I did a really good job of creating that. So... Another thing that I had was a very external locus of control. So for me, going into pregnancy, um, there was kind of, I don't know if it's based on scientific evidence or not, but they say if your mum was sick with morning sickness, then you're likely to be sick. Have you heard of that? I haven't, but it doesn't ring true for me. So (laughs) Okay. Well, that's something that I heard and that was a belief that I had and my mum had never been sick with me Ah. or my brother. So I was like, okay, you know, that's pretty strong evidence that I'm not going to be sick. And I had also been never sick, like that I could remember in my life, even with food poisoning, I never threw up or anything like that. So in a way, I thought that I could either stop myself or I was immune or special or even that my body didn't even know how to be sick so I built up that belief as well I also had um 12 weeks pregnant as being like this special number that if I could hold out to 12 weeks and everything would be okay because that's when your morning sickness stops so I was just like okay I just have to do everything I can to control that 12 weeks and then everything could be dandy which it wasn't and then I also had the option of, you know, going and getting anti-nausea medication if it was bad enough. And then there was also, if it was 
you know, terminating that pregnancy, I could do that as well. And then all the safety seeking and avoidance behaviors I had in between. So that was my way of going about it. I was like, I'm going to control all of these things and everything's going to be okay. And it wasn't so much like that, but that was my reasoning. I wanted to be a mom so bad. And I was like, okay, these are all the ways that I can control that. Right. Okay. So I think that's a really interesting story because I'd never heard that. I didn't know any of that since you've just told me now. Um, And that to me exemplifies the power of our beliefs. Yeah. And the fact, the fact that our beliefs don't need to be based on any evidence whatsoever. They don't need to be based in reality, but we can choose to live our lives based on these beliefs that don't have any founding. So the fact that, you know, um, the, the, the one thing you know with my mum she wasn't didn't have morning sickness so therefore I'm not going to have it you went into pregnancy holding that belief thinking that that mm-hmm. is something that you could control almost if you will yeah um yeah but no no scientific I don't know if there's any scientific as you said I don't actually know that but you didn't go and find the scientific evidence you just thought no this is going to help me get through pregnancy so I'm going to believe it I'm going to believe it whole hog exactly so that's it's really really powerful what we choose to believe uh, which I think people out there yeah. with emetophobia will resonate with. Um, yes. So that's it. that's brilliant. Okay. So yeah, if I because if con- it's a helpful belief for me, you know, I'm going to believe it. I'm not going right. to go out and look for evidence against it. No way. I'm like, Fabulous. this is going to yes. get me through. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And that can keep you stuck with emetophobia mm. when you when you believe really unhelpful beliefs like that yeah and then that doesn't allow you you talked a little bit there about your secondary control which mm-hmm. we can call coping skills so if you don't have those coping skills and you believe that you can't cope when you're not in control then you've got no other option because if you really want to be a mum, you're conflicted aren't you you sort of like I really want yeah. this and I'm gonna have to so I'm gonna have to believe things that are gonna get me through there's no other option yep. because I don't believe I can cope otherwise. So yep. could I ask you what, if you did, did you get morning sickness? Um, hard to say. So okay. the moment I found out I was pregnant, I was instantly nauseous, which mm. isn't probably a surprise because when you have emetophobia, you know, I think you wake up with a 99.9% chance of being sick that day or something like that, something very high. And you can still create like a a lot of feelings of being nauseous just based on that little you know possibility and when you're pregnant I think it's more like a 50 to 70 percent chance that people actually have morning sickness so it's a lot higher so as soon as I found out I was pregnant I instantly just felt so sick and then I didn't then eat food and I stressed about feeling sick which made me feel even more sick so you know it's hard to say yeah. whether I did or I didn't, I did feel a lot more sick um, for the first like 15 weeks of pregnancy for yeah. sure. Yeah. But my, yeah, the way that I was creating anxiety about it, it's it's hard to know whether it was actually true morning sickness or whether I had just worked myself up every single day to be in such a state that okay. that's how I was feeling. Right. So I think it would be useful then at this point to compare and contrast our experiences of that first trimester or my you know you said yes. your morning sickness was um, a few weeks mine, mine finished around 20 now I was over my emetophobia at that point you still had it so I think it's worth looking at the difference between the two experiences and obviously we're mm-hmm. two different people so we were likely to have different experiences anyway yeah but I do yeah. know that I was actively doing things during my first trimester to thrive through it Okay, so it was an active process. I was putting effort into it and I'll go through my experience shortly, but you didn't have any of those skills at that point because you hadn't been through the program. So do you want to just possibly share your experience of that first trimester, what it was like, the, the possibly the safety seekings or, or go into a bit more detail as to how you got through it? Yeah, I was, I was equally excited. I wouldn't say equally, but I was still very excited to be pregnant. Yeah. It was just... It was hard and it did take away a lot of the joy and excitement that pregnancy was supposed to be because I was waking up with like 
a lot of fear and dread and I wasn't really eating. Um, I cried a lot about my appearance. I didn't really have much of a social life because I didn't want people to, I don't know, see me and comment on my body. So I actually deleted my social media and the only photos that I have of my pregnancy is just progress. Like I wanted to see it growing for later. I thought I might be interested in it. Right. And I spent a lot of time outside alone by myself because I was pregnant in winter and any time that I was feeling sick, the way that I coped with that was to distract myself. So I would go out in the freezing cold and walk around and it doesn't matter if it was midnight or three o'clock in the morning, I was out there walking around in the dark, right. you know, trying to distract myself. And that's pretty much the best way I could say that I coped was I just kept distracting myself from it happening. Right. And um, I would go to work and I would sit outside for a lot of the day. I couldn't be inside with all the smells of people making coffee and things like that. And I had this fan and I was just sitting there fanning myself and eating a fruit roll up and crying. And it was just, yeah, it, was, it wasn't It was a very nice experience. And I really had no way of coping. I never thought, you know, I'm going to look up some tools of how to do this in a more helpful way. It was just distract, 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 I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that sounds extremely draining and it tiring. It was draining. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, it was tiring. Which is compounded by the first trimester because again, I don't know about your experience, but I was absolutely exhausted during the first mm -hmm. trimester because I was growing a human um, and that's tiring. Yeah. It's, it's a, a tiredness like I've never felt before. Um, now my experience was vastly different to that. Um, I was just so excited me and my husband um got married in the march um and then we tried we tried to conceive for about 10 months so it was every month you know checking the um pregnancy yeah that would have felt like bit. a long time a long time and, I was yeah. like, okay. and we had friends that had really struggled and we're going through IVF and I was thinking okay well this might be the journey for us and this that and the other but anyway I actually got the positive pregnancy um test when we were renovating the house so we just bought a house um, and it's uh, the house was built in um, 1915 so it's a very very old house and it had been renovated a few times since then but it was very outdated um, and we had cordoned, cordoned off the whole house and we're just living in the kitchen so we were sleeping in the kitchen eating in the kitchen we had a downstairs bathroom with just a toilet and a sink and we bought this um blow up uh, paddling pool if you want to call it a tall blow up paddling pool um, to shower in so we'd have to like stick a um, hose over the taps and then we would shower I'm glad in. you said shower in I was like is this for you to birth in I was like wow no. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come on to birth and plants later <laughs> yeah <laughs> just to shower um, and it was just a very confined space my husband was working from home at the time so he was his desk was at the foot of the bed um, which is again in the kitchen it was all very confined and that's where we you know I fell pregnant so I was doing the whole first trimester thing in that environment. So the smells, as you can imagine, because I was cooking in the room, oh, I was yeah. sleeping in, um, and the dryer, it was actually the smell of the dryer that used to really get me. Now I did have morning sickness. <clears throat> I wasn't actually sick. I was, mm -hmm. apologies people listening, I retched a few times. I had to like leave the house a few times and I didn't yes. bring anything up, but I was, you know, yes, because of the, the same smell thing of the happened dryer. to me. Almost yes. every day. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So mine was only, there was no, it wasn't almost every day, which would indicate anxiety, possibly, but mm -hmm. mine was the smell of the dryer. I don't know why it was the same, the laundry detergent, but that was that. Now I was not enjoying morning sickness. It started week six for me and ended around week 20. Uh, and I was working at the time as well. I was working in a school. Um, so and I was, I was uh, assistant head at the time. So I remember one morning walking down the corridor and before I'd even got to my desk and, and first trimester, I don't know if it's the same in Australia or the world over, I'm not entirely sure, but we didn't want to, the, the risk of miscarriage is much higher before 12 weeks. So yes. we, yeah. I didn't feel comfortable telling anybody I was pregnant until I got to that 12 week mark in case, you know, we lost it and all that kind of stuff. So I couldn't tell anybody, but I felt incredibly nauseous. And yeah. I remember walking down the corridor, five people stopped me before I even got to my desk. Michelle, this has happened. Michelle, this teacher hasn't turned up. We've got a supply. Michelle, this is happening. It was it was like a, 
And I was just, I was, oh, I just want to vomit on all of you. And that's, that's how I felt at the time. But I was able to just manage. I was able to cope. I was able to coach myself through it almost. Wow. So when you are thriving, you have so many skills that you put effort into on a daily basis. So for a start, I'd wake up in the morning and I would really focus on the fact that I was feeling nauseous as a real positive because that means my hormones are high. That means the pregnancy is yeah. probably likely developing well. This is a good thing. Yeah. So yeah. that's how I focused on it. And then I visualized the day. So I'd visualize myself getting ready at the, on the bed and all this kind of stuff because we had nowhere else to get ready and get into school and visualize my day, having a lovely day. So not taking my mind off being pregnant, obviously, but just enjoying what I was doing throughout the day as I do every day, that's part of my routine now. And that really helps to set you up for the day rather than waking up and immediately imagining the worst, imagining being sick at work, imagining not being able to do things, imagine having to come home. Using your imagination to help you rather than hinder you is really, really powerful. So that's something I was doing. My inner voice also at the time was really helpful and really charitable. I was, as we talk about in the program, I was my own best friend in my head. So I was going, you're doing great. You know, if, you, if you're feeling a bit nauseous, if you're feeling a bit lightheaded now, just sit down, have a minute, have a, you know, go and have some water, whatever else. And when I'd get to work, I'd say, you know, I'd told my one colleague, my very, very close one colleague, and I would say, Nick, it was Nick, name dropping it now. Nick, do you mind doing this? I just need a minute. She go, yeah, off we go. Now, before I was emetophobia free, I would never have done that because of the, the amount of pressure I'd be putting on myself to keep going to get everything right and to, you know, don't let this yeah. affect your work and all of that negative, critical self-talk that was no longer there. So the pressure on yourself to perform, if you will, and to get through the day am amazingly well isn't there anymore. Um, yeah. So that inner voice is is particularly important when you are dealing with morning sickness and nausea as an exometophobe because it's never pleasant I mean we've heard it multiple times everyone with a metaphobia no one likes being sick no they don't and nobody likes nausea no they don't but when you're emetophobia free you can manage you can tolerate it I didn't enjoy it I didn't like it I didn't go yippee another day of morning sickness but I chose to focus on the helpful parts of it I chose to think in a calm and confident and capable way because I had the skills to do so so it's very important to compare and contrast the differences between our two stories because my first trimester yeah. I look back on it with real fond memories of it because we had so much Aww. fun renovating the house and so nice. whatever else but you know it's it's so worth get gaining those skills getting yourself skilled Definitely. up so that you can yeah. enjoy that time as much as you can yeah. I mean again not enjoy morning sickness but enjoy the journey of pregnancy now yeah. and I'm going to reflect back on your story now, when you mentioned your body changing and the fact that you were worried about other people seeing that and you didn't, you leached your social media and you were upset about it all yeah. of the time. Um, yeah. that, that feeds in very much to self esteem, social anxiety. Yes. Um, yeah. So I thought we could cover those two things next. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Of so, course. in terms yeah. of self esteem, then, um, when you were pregnant and you were going through all of those changes in your body, because your body does change when you're pregnant, how did you process that? How did you how did you get through that, those changes? What was that experience yeah. like? You briefly touched on it, but Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't very good. Um, as you said before, I you had a positive, you know, helpful inner voice. I didn't. Mine was very negative and catastrophic and brought me down and my self-esteem was already very low. And then, you know, I've had anorexia in the past, so gaining weight was kind of an issue for me. And then being pregnant on top of it and having people comment on my body, even though they were being positive, um, it still, it would just bring me to tears because I let it affect me in that way. And it could just be somebody being like, oh, look how big you've gotten. And for somebody that, you know, wants to be pregnant and loves being pregnant and they're excited about their belly growing, like that's a great thing. But for me that had had anorexia in the past and someone has then called me big, yes. it was almost the worst thing you could say to me. So I wanted yeah. to kind of hide my body a lot from people um, 
I was actually lucky because, not lucky, but grateful in a way, this is a positive, that I was pregnant during COVID. So I could spend a lot of time at home and I didn't really have to go out too much and be around people or go to certain events or anything like that. So that was a little bit helpful in that way. But yeah, my self-esteem was just very low. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's makes the whole process even more difficult if you are being super critical of yourself yeah. and bringing your self-esteem down Yeah. because... And- yeah and I think also another thing was you can't wear the clothes that you used to wear before either so it's kind of just like you're creating this new identity for yourself and I just felt like I'd lost myself completely I was just like I don't know who I am anymore I'm wearing these like big dresses and things (laughs) that I would never usually wear and it just felt yeah it just didn't feel like me and when I was going out I, I just felt like you know with social anxiety everybody was staring at me and they must be thinking you know the negative things that I'm thinking about myself which isn't true people saw me as being amazing and I'm growing this human and Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's such a positive thing but for me you know if you're having that negative talk to yourself you're just assuming everybody else is thinking that way about you too yes do you know I had the same experience with clothes um, I used to wear pencil skirts a lot for work and crop, yeah. crop jumpers. So it, yeah. they would show immediately if I, <laughs> I was pregnant. Um, so I had to change that. And I remember having those thoughts and being like, oh, well, I, I can't wear the, those clothes and I'm going to have to find something that I've never, I've never worn this kind of shape of clothes before because my body's never been this shape before. And I remember having those thoughts and labeling them as unhelpful immediately. So the minute mm-hmm. they came, you know, minute minute I generated that thought, I stuck a big fat sticky label on it as unhelpful because I was, how is that going to help me, you know, enjoy this yeah. pregnancy? So the yeah. minute you, if you're talking about, you know, an external locus of control and believing that your thoughts and emotions happen to you and that you're not in control of them, then that's incredibly difficult when you're faced with something like that because you get a thought you believe it, you buy into it, you run with it. And therefore, you, you know, where you end up crying most of the day because you believe the yeah. thought, helpful thought you've just had. Whereas when you understand how your mind works and you understand that thoughts don't just happen to us, that they are based on our beliefs and that yeah. we can choose, we have the choice as to whether to buy into them or not. So when I yeah. had the thought, crikey, I've got no clothes that fit me here and I've got no money to buy <laughs> to buy any new clothes – because we're renovating this house and we're broke because we were, um, it, it was one thing, well, is that going to help me? Is buying into that belief that I've lost my identity. I also had a similar experience with not being able to exercise because I do a, a lot of running um, and I was a member of the gym at the time. And I just, ha- I love doing that. I still do love doing that. And I wasn't able to do that past, I think I, I ran till about six months. I wasn't able to do that past then. And again, I remember generating some unhelpful thoughts there with, well, you can't run. So ugh, I'm stuck. I'm stuck inside. That's what, you know, those kind of thoughts. Yeah. But again, big fat sticky label on it. Well, okay. We can't do what you used to do. What can you do? How can you make yeah. the most? How can you actively make the most of this situation? So you are, you're inside, you can't go out very far you can't especially towards the end I couldn't walk particularly far um and (laughs) (laughs) waddling everywhere and I was like well okay I've got this time where I can't physically do much what can I do so I started playing video games because I used to enjoy that when I was a teenager Uh, and then you know adult life took over and I got busy and I thought you know what no I'm gonna play video games so I did started playing video games I even got I bought some paints as well and started painting Because I was like, well, this is only temporary and your body changes in pregnancy are only temporary as well. You know, it feels when you buy into your thoughts, your catastrophic thoughts, again, we'll go on to shortly. It feels like it's not going to end. You know, logically it will. And you know, logically that you can, you know, return to your regular shape and size or or as close to post-pregnancy. But at at that moment, if you're buying into those beliefs, it feels massive it feels like it's here to stay and that you can't cope in that moment and whatever else so knowing that that's not true and knowing that actually all of this is temporary all of this means that I'm growing a human I'm going to be a mum which is what I want to be okay what effort can I put into 
this moment to get me through this moment as best I can? How can I even enjoy this moment of not being able to go outside? Yeah. I really want to go outside. That's such a good perspective to have. Yeah. So how can I do I, I was looking for all the evidence to, you know, confirm how I was feeling mm. and mm. that it was a horrible time. Or, yeah. you know, in terms of, you know, people commenting on my body, I'm feeling all these things about myself. I hear someone say, oh, you know, you're so big. Yeah. It confirms everything. And yeah. it's so nice that you had that, you know, this is an unhelpful belief. So mm-hmm. I'm going to change it to something positive. You're looking for all the positive things. And right. it's yeah. awesome to hear that. Yeah. And it's an active, it's an active thing. So it's, um, I think I've said it on a few podcasts now, thriving is not something that you go through the program, you overcome your metaphobia and then you stop doing. It's, a, it's almost a way of life. It's something that you've got to put effort yeah. into every day. But it's effort that you yeah. really want to spend because it feels good. <laughs> you're making, yeah. you're creating a really lovely life for yourself. So why would you not yeah. want to put your effort into that? Um, yeah. So that's that's worth pointing out as well. Okay. Now, social anxiety wise, pregnancy comes with a whole host of social anxiety um, related topics. Particularly, I don't know about your experience, but friends and family their beliefs on what you should or shouldn't be doing when you were pregnant so I had a lot of you shouldn't be running you should stop running immediately when you're pregnant Um, and again because I was thriving at the time I thought okay I've not actually looked at the research let me look at the evidence so I did my research I looked at the evidence if you're already a runner crack on so I did and I was able to not generate that guilt not generate that sense of unease or the awkwardness and able to have that sense of self and solid sense of self-esteem to be able to chat to that person and be, and say I've looked at the evidence it's okay you know I'm going to carry yeah. on doing it and they didn't accept it and there was that that discomfort and then no I still think you're wrong and you we had this backwards and forwards but I was able to tolerate that discomfort because it is uncomfortable when you disagree with your friends and family tolerate it move through it and enjoy my running very very different when you are suffering with a metaphobia and somebody disagrees with you because you are likely to brood about it, to catastrophize, to create a lot of social anxiety, a lot of awkwardness, a lot of unease about it and to worry about it a lot. Um, So I'm wondering if there's, did you have similar experiences with friends, family, other people telling you what you should, shouldn't be doing? Not necessarily because as I said, it was in the middle of COVID and Mm. I kind of isolated myself so much that I only had people around me that were very, you know, collusive and right. they would, if I said something, they would do it. They wouldn't challenge me on it. Right. And okay. so I kind of was living in that little safety bubble. And for the first four months of my pregnancy, actually, I lived with my mom because oh. I didn't even want to be away from her. So I had it very safe and cozy. I think in terms of what you're saying, possibly that might've been the case around authority figures like doctors, if they had told me, you know, to do something, I probably wouldn't have had enough like self-confidence or to be able to set that boundary to be like, no, I'm not comfortable doing this. I think whatever they wanted to do kind of goes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, But that didn't actually happen. Did it not? Oh, so we suppose COVID, I suppose. COVID wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. So that's slightly different for myself. It was um, when you are thriving, because we know social, for those of you that don't know, actually it's social anxiety and overcoming that, generating social confidence and building social confidence for yourself, stable social confidence is part of the program. So when you understand how to do that, going to midwife appointments, going to doctor's appointments, um, going to hypnobirthing classes and things along those lines, is a really empowering experience because you know that you don't just have to agree with the person in the white coat telling you X, Y, or Z. You know that you can question, you know that you can um, ask for more information. You know that you can, even if they are disagreeing with you or or not happy to give you that information to push for it, Um, which is really important when you are dealing with your unborn child. It's it's to have that level of self-confidence is important. And in terms of birthing plans, because that was something that was quite big, uh, certainly when I was pregnant, obviously COVID was different because I guess you had very strict rules on what you could and couldn't do. 
during pregnancy? Yeah, and COVID? I suppose so. Yeah. So the, the moment that I was, I think it was a week before my due date, they scheduled me in to be induced ah. a few days after if you didn't go on your due date because of COVID and the way ah. that it was staffed and things like that. And you also couldn't have, you could have one person in the hospital with you, but yep. that was it. So you, I right. couldn't have my mum with me. Right. Okay. So very different because all of that had been relaxed when I was pregnant and due to give birth. Yeah. So I had the option of home birth. I had the option of midwife center. I had the option of hospital. Um, and I did something called hypnobirthing, which sounds can sound quite woo, but it's not. It's basically yeah. very scientific. <laughs> it's very science-based. And what, what is actually going to happen to your body scientifically um, during the giving birth process, which is really empowering in itself because you get gain that yeah. understanding. I think I enjoyed it because it's knowledge based, the same as this program, really understanding that actually, even if I was unconscious, I'd still give birth. Right. So even <laughs> it's that's, and that's a really, I was like, oh, okay, that's fine. That for me, I was like, okay, well, I can relax now. <laughs> it's going to happen either way. But there's lots of, if I was still a metaphobia, still a metaphobic, sorry, I would have really, knowing myself back then, been hyper focused on having the birth that I wanted so it would have been okay well I, I want this and I'm not having that and I'm not having drugs because they're going to make me sick and I'm not doing this and I'm not doing that and this is how it's going to all go out I might have even opted for a c-section to to eliminate all of that drug situation for the you know wow. pain of, of birth possibly because I you know in my mind back then yeah, okay but knowing that I could cope I didn't know I didn't know the pain of childbirth I'd never been in it but I had the information, I was able to go, well, this would be the ideal. And me and my husband discussed on this would be the ideal. But actually, if I needed the pain release at that time, then fine, go for it. I did end up having an epidural. Um, and I think we'll talk, I think we'll do in the second podcast, didn't we say about birth and postpartum? Because that's a different topic sure. entirely, um, sure. which we would be great. Yeah. Um, but not having to be controlling right if you look back to the beginning of this conversation when you were saying you were really really controlling everything around you so your you know your primary control skills were really high I still had those control skills but I also had really high coping skills so I was able to look at the evidence decide what I would prefer to have as a, as a birth but also know that if it didn't go that way I'd cope so therefore you yeah, go you into can adapt to whatever situation you're in correct yeah, yeah. so I could go into birth as relaxed as possible at that moment mm -hmm. and, and pregnancy as relaxed as relaxed as possible um, because you've got those coping skills to fall back on. Um, so if we've kind of got gone off on a tangent there between social anxiety, but I think that's important. No, that in is terms so, of, that's so nice. It's so nice that you had that experience. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So it's for, for people who are out there who are thinking of getting pregnant or are already pregnant, um, knowing that this program will allow you to relax if you obviously it takes the effort and takes the consistency and the dedication but that sense of keeping a tight lid on everything which is what you mm. feel like a lot of the time I certainly did with the metaphobia you're just keeping a just keeping a lid on it all controlling that and controlling yeah. that and controlling that and making sure everything's just right and limiting your risk of being sick and putting lots of effort into making sure all of this doesn't happen you still have all of those control skills, but you don't feel the need to use them because you know that you'll cope. So when you yeah. don't need to use them anymore, you relax and life is much yeah. more enjoyable and you can just enjoy, sit back and enjoy the journey of pregnancy because it's a, I say it's a beautiful journey. I My experience of it was absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Um, that sounds so nice. Yeah, and <laughs> it's not, it, morning sickness, the biggie, I think for most people, it's morning sickness. It's not enjoyable, but it's manageable. Now, I was, I said I was never sick, right? But even if I was, I know I'd have been fine. I'd have been okay. I yeah. know that for sure because yeah. I have been since. So important that you know that you don't just have to muddle through pregnancy with a metaphobia. You can overcome this thing. You don't need to have that experience tainted by your metaphobia. It's something that yeah. you can overcome. Okay. Definitely. So yeah. a particularly sensitive topic then to just come on to briefly is the notion of terminations and abortions because of a metaphobia. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah. you had that in the back of your mind um, going yes. into pregnancy. Um, do you yes. want to just talk through your thought process at that time and obviously to reassure yeah. people out there that if that is the case or, or you have terminated a pregnancy because of your metaphobia, that not to create that guilt about it? Yes, of course. Yeah. So the first time that I was ever pregnant, I did have a miscarriage and I put the reason that that happened based on, I think you could call it like superstitious or fatalistic or something like that. I thought that the universe didn't think that I could be pregnant because I couldn't handle the morning sickness or because of the emetophobia. So I had a lot of guilt in that sense around, you know, it was my fault because of this and you know, the universe is trying to teach me to, you know, it was, um, I know that's not, not what it's like now, but, um, that's what happened. And then they wanted you blaming me to, yourself. I'm just, I'm just trying to wrap my head around. So you were blaming yourself almost for that miscarriage, weren't you? Oh, of course. Yes. A hundred percent. Yes. Cause I was pregnant for a few weeks. I felt a bit sick and then I had a miscarriage and yeah, I was like, this is, the reason because I'm healthy I should be able to have a baby like this is the reason why I was very superstitious and into you know the universe doing things to teach you lessons and things like that so that was just what I attribute it to and then yeah I held on to that to be like this is my fault and they wanted me to have a procedure done where they put you under like an aesthetic to remove the miscarriage and I just refused because I kind of had the belief that if you went under anesthetic, you would be sick. It would yep. make you sick because I wasn't even taking Panadol if I had a headache. So I was no way going to be letting somebody put me under. And that's just that whole control as well to not want somebody to put you under and you don't know yep. what's happening. So I ended up um, like flying to my mom's house and staying there and she kind of looked after me, of course, because it's my mom. And um, she was there with everything. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I ended up having it dragged out for so much longer and the emotional pain and the physical pain of it, rather than just, like, getting it done then and there in the hospital, I, I just dragged out that whole experience and I made myself feel so guilty and it was just horrible. And um, so going into the termination, I just wanted to say to anybody out there that if – terminating a pregnancy was a last resort for you and you're also living with some kind of guilt that mm. like I see you and you're not alone and I'm so Absolutely. sorry because yeah. having a metaphobia is so lonely but if you're processing all of that guilt like on top of that as well and you were just trying to protect yourself from what you think is a 10 out of 10 you know situation that you fear so much that's a threat and you were just being rational and trying to keep yourself safe so I just want to say that you don't have to hold on to that guilt and you can forgive yourself for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's emetophobia for people listening. They understand the fear um, and the, the absolute terror that you feel when faced yes. with being sick. Um, and myself yeah. and Brie also fully understand that fear that you feel. People without emetophobia may not and may never understand that, but it is completely understandable why you would do that. And yes. it's not something to beat yourself up about. It's not something to create guilt about. Um, but if pregnancy is something that you want to do again and to you know start a family, it is possible. So please don't Definitely feel possible. that you can't do it. And it's something that's not you know in the stars or whatever else for you. You can get that control of your life. And if starting a family becoming a mom is something that you want to do you can do it and this program can yeah. help so yes. a little research yeah. Into it. yeah my experience with pregnancy and emetophobia was horrible and for a long time I thought I could never be pregnant again because I could never put myself through that and now doing Thrive I'm actually so excited to be pregnant again one day knowing what I know now I'm <laughs> like my experience is just going to be so much better and yeah. it's just going to be so much fun to be able to use all of these things, like you said, the positive inner voice yeah. and the visualization yeah. and all that kind of things, put it into yes. practice and yeah. really enjoy it because it's one of the best things that can happen to you. It is. It really is. Yeah. Absolutely. It is. Um, and it's, you know, another tangent that we've not really covered is the unhelpful thinking styles that you have when you are 
emetophobic, so you are particularly, most emetophobes, particularly catastrophic, particularly obsessive, um, perfectionist as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So getting a handle and understanding of those thinking styles before going into pregnancy or, or during pregnancy, if you're currently pregnant, is really, really helpful because not only do you, as we described earlier, understand that those thoughts don't just happen to you, you can spot when you are being catastrophic. You can spot when you yes. are being, you're thinking in a perfectionist way or being a bit of a perfectionist. And when you can spot those things, you can do something about it. Now, I don't know about you, but before I did this program, I didn't know those things existed. I didn't actually know, particularly no. the brooding, particularly the brooding. I remember reading about it and my initial thought was, do people think differently? Is there a different way to think? Because <laughs> I didn't, yeah. I'd never not brooded. I'd never thought in a different way. So understanding, getting that self insight and getting that real good understanding of yourself and how you think and your thinking habits while you are in a metaphobe is so powerful because not only yeah. can you understand that your thoughts don't just happen to you and you can slap a big label of unhelpful on them, you can spot when you are being a particular kind of way, catastrophic perfectionist, and do something about it. And you can put effort yeah. in, active effort, to change it and to manage your thinking and therefore change the experience you have of pregnancy and create the experience you want of pregnancy. So just like thriving day in, day out is an active process, something that you put effort into, same goes for pregnancy. If you want a certain experience of pregnancy, then create it for yourself. Let's do it. Let's go for it. Let's yeah. build up our skills. Let's gain that knowledge. Let's create the experience we want rather than fearing the worst case scenario and creating a really unhelpful anxiety ridden pregnancy. Yes. Because your imagination is so strong. If you want to be in that place, you'll be in that place. Absolutely. That's where I was. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so to finish off, um, we've got a few challenges to um, help you so that the, or that you can do at home to get you ready for pregnancy. Bree, do you want to introduce yeah. our challenges? Yeah, I think these are helpful things um, before you're pregnant just to kind of feel a little bit uncomfortable in ways that are related to pregnancy. So the first one could be trying to feel a bit full because I know people that have emetophobia don't like the sensation of being full. But yep. when you're pregnant and you eat something, it doesn't matter how little it is, you just instantly feel full. We well, like that too. <laughs> like it's just like, oh, I just feel so uncomfortable and bloated and everything like sits high. So um, I think if you can feel good, if you can feel full yeah, and not so create much. anxiety, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, maybe putting some like an outfit on that you don't really like how you look in to mm -hmm. get the feeling of you know having that positive self talk and you're not defined by what you look like because once yeah. you're pregnant you're you're kind of stuck that way you know Absolutely. so and your clothes change. Um, another one could be you know wearing an outfit that might be a little bit tighter, like just around the house to feel uncomfortable because yeah. we're so used to you know everything being comfy cozy when we have a metaphobia that yep. you know nothing can be uncomfortable or feel wrong yes. so that's a good one and another one could be going to a hospital and just like you don't have to eat anything there but sit and have a cup of tea and get used to being in a hospital environment because that mm -hmm. one was really hard for me to go to doctor's right. appointments and sit next to other women that could potentially be sick because they're sitting there for appointments and they've got morning sickness and that was a lot of, you know, it was yeah. different, you know, doing that. And maybe giving up something in the day that you love, like coffee or something like that, because if you do have those food aversions, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you can do little things or even just like sleeping on a different side than you usually do, just doing something to prepare you for being uncomfortable and something that you will eventually might have to change. So that could Fabulous. be helpful. Yes. So all the things you're describing there are stretching your comfort zone in terms of yep. your tolerance of discomfort, because yes. as beautiful as pregnancy is, and it is, there are points where it's particularly uncomfortable for whatever reason, particularly towards the end for myself. It was lying on a certain side and having pillows yeah. underneath me and this you know underneath my hips and in between my legs and yeah. I tried one of those big pillows that wrapped around you and then that didn't work and so it's <laughs> particularly uncomfortable but 
every time you do one of these challenges or you you stretch your comfort zone in the smallest of ways to prepare yourself, you must get your inner voice speaking in a helpful way. So instead of going, okay, yeah, I've done that. I've got through that. Yeah, that's fine. You want to go change that narrative to, I can cope with this. Well done me. This is uncomfortable and I can manage because what you're trying to do is become your own best friend in your head and build up your coping skills. Because when we spend our lives trying to stay in our comfort zone and to not experience any discomfort, then going through something like pregnancy is going to be much harder because you are forced out of your comfort zone. So if you take those steps and then really process it powerfully, you've taken the step, you can cope, I'm managing, this is only temporary, well done me, I can manage pregnancy. That's going to really set you up nicely. If you don't process these challenges in that powerful way, then they're unlikely to provide any sort of positive for you. Yeah, you have to leave doing the challenge, feeling empowered and feeling the next time I do this, it's going to be a little bit less uncomfortable or I can even take it a bit further and do this. And you start to see that progress. Absolutely. And you grow that inner voice, that positive inner voice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And if you haven't already listened to all of the podcasts, I suggest doing that as well, because that will give you more of an insight into the program and how to refine your thinking to empower you even further. Um, And obviously, if you've not done the program, obviously, we're going to advocate for it. But if now isn't the time for you, at least listening to those free podcasts and getting your self-awareness up is only going to be helpful. Yeah. Fabulous. Well, thank you very much. That's been really, really good. Um, We will be back soon with a pregnancy post-pregnancy podcast. It's post-pregnancy podcast. Birthing and postpartum. Yes, let's do birthing and postpartum. Okay, so have a lovely day. Thank you so much for coming on and I will speak to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.